All right, we're now discussing water rights, and if you uh, look at your outline, you will see that uh, we have uh, included a, a link to the Mississippi Code of 1972, uh, Section 4959, Rights of Riparian Owners on Gulf Coast Defined. Now, basically, this is included in your materials just to give you a sense of what riparian rights are. And basically, riparian, riparian, the word riparian refers to river, and in most cases, these, these rights are, are river rights, but they're basically water rights, and, and, and they're the rights of a, a landowner uh, to the water that's adjacent to his or her property. That's basically what we're talking about, riparian rights. And uh, we, in illustra illustrative of these... Uh, issues. We have a, uh, a Supreme Court case from 1914. This is the Archer versus Greenville Sand case uh, concerning uh, the issue of uh, water rights, riparian rights. Now one of the things that's important uh, to, to consider and for you to, uh, to employ when you get to law school or in law school is um, diagramming a case. And very often you may have done this kind of thing when you were an undergraduate. And, it, and the same holds true here. You can diagram a case basically by using balloons and putting the names of the various parties inside the balloons and using arrows from the balloons to a uh, di you know, different direction. Let's say the, uh, P is suing D or Pi is suing Delta, P V Delta, Pi versus Delta. Uh, uh, and then have within the uh, diagram the issues of law or the facts of the case. You can, you can do all this because in complicated cases sometimes you'll have a giving property to B and then B giving it to C and C giving it to D and D sues, you know, E. Um, and sometimes it gets very hard to keep track of all this. Sometimes the names are confusing. So diagramming the case like this particular case is something you may find useful. Now this case was a case involving uh, uh, the, the use of gravel by the gravel company under the uh, plaintiff's, uh, uh, allegedly under the plaintiff's land. Now in this particular case what was happening was this gravel company was taking sand and gravel and uh, it was taking the sand and gravel from the riverbed that was adjacent to the petitioner's property. And uh, the, the issue was whether or not uh, and this is this is valuable material. The the, the the sand and gravel that are used in this material in this material uh, had very uh, significant commercial value. So the question was whether or not these, this gravel company could just come out, come down the river and start dredging the river and taking out the sand and gravel and, and the landowners at the banks of the river. And uh, now here we are at a, at a at a beautiful location where we happen to be in Long Island Sound. Uh, imagine that this is a situation where you own this particular meadow. And um, you own, you know, up to the to the shore. So the question is, if someone comes out to start dredging out here, and they start taking out sand and gravel, and this is your land, and they make a lot of money off this, this operation. It's going on and on and on for some period of time, for months, we'll say. You say you're scratching your head. You say, well, wait a minute. I mean. Uh, I knew something about riparian rights a long time ago. I think that they, you know, they have to compensate me. They have to get my permission because that's my gravel. And that's what, that's what the, the, the issue was in this particular case. Whether or not the landowner had rights in the water, the riparian rights in the water. And it's a very interesting case because they, they talk about, the Supreme Court talks about the fact that uh, there, are, there are, you know, there, there's a question of whether there's an adequate remedy at law. Uh, a, a remedy at law is a remedy of, for damages, and essentially what it means is is that uh, the uh, plaintiff could sue for damages if they have an adequate remedy at law. Uh, on the other hand, if you do not have an adequate remedy at law, then you're, you're, you're asking the court to force the defendant to do something. Uh, we went over this previously, and, and here you see it again. And basically, an inadequate remedy at law means that you are approaching the, car, the court as a court of equity. You are seeking, you are seeking equitable relief. And that's what uh, was at issue here, whether or not there was some equitable remedy that would have been appropriate for this particular situation. 
And uh, the court goes on to talk about, you know, the various uh, factors that would be involved in, in that in determining uh, whether or not there's an adequate remedy of law. Uh, the law of Mississippi is an element of this case, and the court says that the law, the line of the territory, uh, was the middle of the Mississippi River. In other words, the court looked at Mississippi law and uh, determined by Mississippi law that the dividing line was the middle of the river. And uh, there's a, there is a, a, a Latin term, you'll find many Latin terms in here, where the court uses the, the Latin term ad filum. And actually the full Latin term is ad medium filum valle, which is to the middle of the way. And this is an important uh, distinction in, in, in the court's case because what it means is that uh, the determination is that the owner of the land has his or her ownership rights extend past the border, past the, the shoreline, into the middle of the water. So in this, in this particular case, you can see that this, if that law were to apply in this situation, then the water, the, the property line will go all the way out to the middle, which is about, oh, I would estimate, oh, that looks like it's about a good, oh, maybe four miles, so maybe we'll say it would be like about two miles out, and all of the minerals that were on the, on the riverbed, or in this case, Long Island Sound bed, would be yours. You would be entitled to uh, injunctive relief and, uh, and accounting, uh, which is what the uh, plaintiffs thought in this particular action. Um, and, you know, very often uh, the, the court will identify uh, certain elements of the law that uh, are, are almost not comical but uh, somewhat amusing. And they, the court talks about the fact that the, uh, the defendants are, argue that uh, uh, the defendants argue that it would be a violation of federal law for the plaintiff to make these kinds of an assertions. And the court was the court says that whether she took the gravel from the front of her land, she would incur the condemnation of the of a federal act. It's not necessary to decide. She had she certainly had such an interest in the conditions to prevent one without any right from disturbing them. So you know the court's saying, look, whatever whatever she could have done in terms of federal law has nothing to do with you. You had no rights whatsoever. And the court goes on to say that we cannot help observing that the gravel company, by its conduct, has given an interpretation of the act against its own contention, unless indeed it wishes to confess itself a violator of public law in order to escape responsibility for private industry, for private injury. Uh, that's one of your uh-ohs. That's one of your oops. In other words, the, the court's saying that, you know, you, you, the lawyers have gone too far. They made an argument that really is, is, is something that's not against their interests. And it, it, it's simple. It, it, it's not entirely amusing when you, you get that from the United States Supreme Court.